Ramadan Mubarak, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our amal that we have managed to do so far and give us the tawfiq to carry on taking the best from this month inshallah wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces the month of fasting in the Quran, after he says fasting has been made compulsory on you the way it was made compulsory on the people before you, he adds a statement of reason. He says, la'allakum tattaqoon. This la'alla is that perhaps, maybe, if everything is right, the prize at the end of the day is taqwa. The fasting will lead you to taqwa if all other conditions are met. So we want to know what is this taqwa and why is it so important? In actual fact, according to the Quran, the single reason for the distinction and fadila of one human being over another human being is this one factor only. Nothing else matters. You cannot go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say how generous you are, how rich you are. Allah is richer, Allah is more generous. You cannot say to Allah that these are my merits and these are my good acts and all this over the other people. The merit that Allah is interested in is taqwa. He says, A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Ya ayyuhal nas, O people, not even O muslimin, O people, O mankind. Inna khalaqnakum in dhakarin wa untha. You are all created from one man, one woman. Wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'il. I made you into these tribes and nations. We have different colors. We have different, we look different. We speak differently. We have different classes in society. Why? Lita'arafu. So that you may recognize each other. But don't think that whatever level you are, whichever land you live in, whatever you have, in possessions and assets, don't think that that makes a difference to me. What makes to me a, makes a difference to me is inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. The ones from you who have honor in the eyes of God are those who possess this taqwa. So if taqwa is the goal of fasting and if taqwa is the means of distinction in the eyes of God, we need to try to figure out what it is and how to gain it and how to keep it. So, when we look at taqwa, it is a kind of protection that we keep around us, a shield if you like, that stops us from going into an area which would displease Allah. This is what it is. It is a shield. And it means that being so conscious of God at every moment that you do not step into a direction which you know Allah is displeased with. And certainly you do not do it by accident, by purpose, and you hope not to do it by accident. So this taqwa, this shield that you present around you, how does it come about? Well, first of all, it comes about by you being very mindful of every single thing you do and every single thing you say. That you ask yourself, that is this a direction that I am taking? Is this towards God? Or is this something that maybe I stray into a thing where I am defying God or God is not pleased with this? So this constant mindfulness is the first thing. And taqwa is strengthened by amal, by action, by iman and amal. It is something that becomes stronger and stronger as you begin to obey God more and more. It is not something you can just design and say from tomorrow I will be buttaqi. It is something that comes with practice. When one begins to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after faith, then the result is taqwa. One of them of course is the fast, but how can we put this into practice? You see what happens sometimes is we do not have the faith. To, we don't have the belief. Yes, we have the teachings, but really will it work or not, we don't know. So when we don't know, then our actions are not with conviction. For example, you are told the fasting will give you taqwa. You're not sure how. Or you are told that salat will keep you away from fahsha. Or you are told the hijab is wajib and necessary, you see. Or you are told halal is good and haram is dangerous, you see. I'm trying to think about this. It doesn't make sense to me. It's the same food 
same food. I can't see the difference. It's the same modesty, same what I can't see. This is where we sometimes get stuck. Taqwa will come from faith in what you have been taught. I can give you an example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to us that there is a reward at the end of this activity. I can't see it because my aql, my mind cannot conceive it. Suppose I say to you, my friend, 20 meters away from you is the most beautiful painting you have ever seen. It is the most glorious thing. You are 20 meters away. Go and see how beautiful it is. So you say, before I go there, I must see it from here. I must try to understand it. It's dark, so you take out your torch and you shine it towards the painting. The problem is your painting, your torch only works 10 meters. It's not more powerful than that. So you put it to 10 meters, you don't see anything. You say, you know what, I don't think there is a painting because I can't see it. However, if you walk 10 meters out of faith, out of trust, that I have been told this by someone I trust. The Quran has told me this. My prophet has told me this. You trust him and you do the amal. When you reach 10 meters and you shine your torch, you will see that, that painting, which you could have never seen from point zero, but you can see it from 10 meters and you think, mashallah, it really is there. It's so beautiful. So taqwa comes from amal. You have to act. Act on what you know is wajib. Stay away from what you know is haram. Do the mustahabbat for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do everything and you watch how this taqwa is, comes about. So, and taqwa is a journey. Everybody has a little bit of taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says that the Quran was revealed hudan lil muttaqeen. So you say, well, is it hudan lil muttaqeen? Then it's, it's not hudan for others. It's not a guide for others, only for the people of taqwa. No. Everybody has a small level of taqwa. For example, even a person who is not a Muslim or a person who has no faith, he has a level of taqwa. For example, he will not go on the streets without clothes on. This is his level because you ask him, why don't you do that? He says, this is my level of shame. I would not do this. But when we come to the journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are many grades of this taqwa depending on your effort, even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is told, Ittaqullah. So he, there is a journey. Everybody is on this journey. And when you come on this journey, how do you know you have taqwa? Taqwa is manifestation of Allah's will in action. This is how it is. It's proportional to one's faith. Um, and of course, when you have this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you in the most honorable group. In the Quran, he says, يَوْمَ نَحْشُرُ الْمُتَّقِينَ إِلَى الرَّحْمَانِ وَفْدًا On that day, the muttaqeen will be called and called to Allah in an honored group of people. They will be men of wafd, they will be called with honor. وَنَسُوقُ الْمُجْرِمِينَ إِلَى جَهَنَّمَ وِرْدًا While the sinners and those who do not have taqwa are told to proceed towards Jahannam. So, we have to ask ourselves carefully, that this fasting should not be in vain. It has a purpose, it has a meaning, it has a goal. We need to try to achieve that goal. Much can be said about taqwa, much has been said about taqwa, and it's not a, a concept that is new to us. Nahju Balagha's main theme is taqwa. Uh, Amir al-Mumin salam never far from this idea of taqwa. So we can learn many things from the seerah of the ulama, so from the seerah of Ahlul Bayt also. Uh, in the first instance, how to go about this. Inshallah, Ta'ala, may Allah be, make us successful in this. Inshallah, Ta'ala. On the issue of the Masail, there are certain things that we should not do when we fast. Because if we do them, they nullify the fast. They are called muftirat, they, they break the fast. Um, and there is a whole list of them. There's about eight or there's about nine of them listed by the fuqaha. So today, inshallah, and tomorrow's segment, we will look at these uh, to, to make sure we understand them. The first thing, of course, is eating and drinking. And by eating and drinking, we mean intentional eating and drinking. So if somebody, for example, because it is he forgot in the early days of month of Ramadan and so on, and they, you drank water because somebody gave it to you, 
and you realize later on, Astaghfirullah, I'm fasting. How did I do this? It doesn't invalidate the fast. The moment you realize, you must stop. If there is some water in your mouth, you spit it out and, and, and your fast is still okay and there is no qadha either. So it is intentional eating and drinking. But by forgetting, it, is, it does not invalidate the fast. Sometimes people say, I'm not eating, but I'm tasting or I'm trying to chew the food, uh, make it softer for my child, or I'm tasting it because I'm cooking the food and I want to make sure the salt, you know, at the end of a day of fasting, you don't want to get the salt wrong. People get angry, maybe. But anyway, you're tasting it. It's okay. Because why? It does not go down the throat. It's not eating something. And you just, once you finish, you can just... Uh, spit out that and not swallow it. Some people say, well, suppose I have saliva in my mouth and lots of saliva and I swallow that. Is that like drinking? No. If the saliva is in the mouth and you are swallowing it, it's okay. Um, uh, there are other basiles sometimes people say, like for example, a person might think, I'm using an asthma pump, an inhaler. Now that is going down, is it is it going into um, and breaking my fast as food? No, it's allowed because it does not, it's not enter the stomach, it enters rather the respiratory tract. And so this is something that does not break the fast. Essentially, uh, people say, if I take an injection, if I take an injection, uh, for example, you take an injection in an aesthetic for some treatment. Right. That does not break the fast. The Fukaha say if it is some sort of tonic that you take it and it gives you strength, then it, this is makru, but does not break the fast either. It does not go down the throat into the stomach. But generally speaking, we should stay away from those things that somehow give us food in a different way. Um, and, and if there is, uh, you know, as technology goes forward, God knows, I was hearing about things that are put on the skin stuck on the skin and they give some sort of strength and some sort of nourishment. So far the Fukaha rule, this is Bakru. The second thing is that physical intimacy with your spouse breaks the fast. So sexual intimacy or even, and this comes istimna and masturbation, these kind of things, they, if they are done in the fast, they break the fast. So those are things that we need to keep in mind. And the third thing is ascribing lies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to Rasulullah and to Aima alayhi salam and including, uh, you know, as for precaution, Janab Sayyidah salamullahi alayha as well, the Ba'asumeen alayhi salam. What does ascribing lies mean? It means either yourself saying that this is in the Quran, this the Prophet definitely said, this happened to Imam al Hussein in Karbala when you know that this did not happen. And you know for a fact that it did not happen, but somehow you are saying it. This, if done knowingly while you are fasting, break the fast. Or if someone asks you, Has, is this what the Prophet said? And you know he said it, but for some reason you say, no, he didn't say this. Whichever way, if you are doing a, attributing a lie, it may be a mistake, that's something else. You find out later on that what I said was wrong, but at that time it, you thought it was right, that doesn't break the fast. So we have to be careful, more careful than normal when we are speaking on behalf of what Allah may have said or the Prophet or Daim alayhi salam, that it can break the fast. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. رمضان عاش بقدسه رمضان شهر عنت لجلاله الأزمان